Hey, you guys, and welcome to this week's episode of Hormonally Speaking. Glad you're here as always. I brought on this week's guest because I feel like this is a really, really important topic that's coming up a lot these days with women that I work with, women that I know, and that is about dealing with alcohol and dealing how you, when you, you know, are starting to creep into your forties, maybe alcohol doesn't feel as good to your body anymore. Maybe you are getting to a place where it's not really serving you in the way that it did before, but it's still kind of this part of your life because it's so much a part of our culture. And, you know, if you look left and right, there's unfortunately all of these things that are like, Hey, ladies, like treat yourself by drinking some wine, or especially if you're dealing with kids, you know, the end of the day, kind of like come down from everything in that day is to have a drink, but what is this doing to our bodies and ourselves? So I brought on Tifa Halleck, who is, um, she has a unique resume that blends 25 years of environmental activism with decades of business leadership, project management, and sustainable local government work. Her interdisciplinary expertise is a valuable asset to elected officials, CEOs, and executive directors who must remedy complex environmental, operational, or financial issues. Tifa's ability to cultivate successful endeavors while staying true to core values makes her a welcome member of many teams, especially those looking to make a real difference in the world. You can find out more at her website, tifahalleck.com. Welcome, Tifa. Thank you, Christine. It's really sweet to be with you today. Oh, I'm excited. So, you know, as I was just kind of diving into the topic today is obviously about alcohol and then actually removing alcohol from your life, which is what you did just about a little over two years ago. Is that right? That's correct. Yep. Yeah. I made a two year mark in July. Congratulations. Thank you. It feels good. So let's start with why. Why did you decide to cut back or cut out alcohol? Yeah, thank you. So in effort of to be succinct here, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to spend all day on the reasons why, because they are plentiful. <laughs> um, if I had to pick maybe my top couple of reasons, um, I found with a, a child who has high needs. So she's kind of borderline special needs. She mm -hmm. has ADHD diagnosis. She's eight years old. And um, I found that she, well, First off, she requires more patience, I think, than mm -hmm. other children mm -hmm. and so and higher skill level in um, navigating some of the challenges she presents. Mm -hmm. So in order to be the best mom I can be to her, I found that um, taking the ease or taking the edge off with alcohol was not contributing to my patience level mm. or my depth of creativity mm -hmm. when it came to uh, working out problems. So mm -hmm. just generally problem solving and guiding her through life. You know, I was fatigued because, and I wasn't a heavy drinker. That's something I'd like to point out. I wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, behind closed doors, tipping the bottle back or anything like right. that. And yet I still feel that alcohol was not presenting a positive influence in my family dynamic specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, oh, I hear my phone going off. Let me turn the ringer off, right? Sure. Yeah, <laughs> it happens. Um, and I'm glad that you brought up that point that you weren't like this heavy drinker, because I think it can be very easy to say, well, I only drink on occasion or, you know, I drink maybe one drink at a time and people don't, and I'm not saying that's a problem necessarily, but people don't think, oh, this could be really causing issues because it's not that much or I'm not like dependent oh. on it. Well, I would like to explain, define that a little bit more. So my mm -hmm. habit was like two glasses of wine with dinner mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and while I would have one glass while I was cooking dinner, mm -hmm. I almost never wanted to even cook dinner unless I had a glass of wine in my hand, right, right. kind of an issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I would have one with dinner. And by that point I was kind of numbed out mm -hmm. to if whatever challenges presented, mm -hmm, right? So mm -hmm. a child could present challenges. My marriage could present challenges mm -hmm. and I would just feel them less. Yeah. And that's family time, right? Dinner time is family time. Yeah. Family time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
So I would say some other reasons, maybe two other reasons health was substantial. Mm -hmm. um, I found when I would lay down and um, it would be story time at night, I when I would get horizontal after say I'd had three glasses, because mm -hmm. you know, it didn't always stop at two, it sure. mostly stopped at two. Mm -hmm. um, but when I would, especially with red wine, I would find that I would get some heart um, arrhythmia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I would have this fluttering thing as I'm laying only horizontal, it happened. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that just didn't seem great yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah like, another not good. health issue is i rosacea runs in my family mm -hmm. and rosacea was you know creeping in and mm -hmm. getting worse as mm -hmm. i was advancing in age especially and with so, red wine that's a big trigger for sure. wine, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so i'm 45 now and mm -hmm. i've definitely seen a propensity of people who um who have that response to alcohol, mm -hmm. having it get worse with age mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. having it leave kind of long lasting effects on mm -hmm. their skin condition. Yeah, absolutely. And so I've battled with a series of acne when I was younger and I don't even want to go down the road of uh, yet again, another debilitating skin condition. Yeah, so. absolutely. And, you know, I, I talk about this a lot on this podcast that like perimenopause, which, you know, technically essentially starts at 35, but we really kick into it in our forties, whether we have many changes or not, that's still our, our hormonal, you know, cycle is changing. And in some ways it's second puberty. And so that is when the skin issues can really come up, you know, especially if we did have acne before, sometimes that'll show up for women again. And you're like, what? <laughs> you're like, I already went through this. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think those are probably the biggest. Main um, reasons. So, and to to illustrate a little bit more about that idea of taking the edge off and what it means to not do that, mm -hmm. um, something interesting I found was while not using a substance, I mean, to take, you know, whether it's somebody smoking a cigarette or mm -hmm. smoking herb or drinking, um, it's all doing the same thing where you're numbing yourself to the point where you're actually not perceiving like the lifelong collection of challenges that mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. maybe not faced mm -hmm. or processed thoroughly. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that it was, that one came as a surprise to me. Like I had just yeah. this mountain of unprocessed stuff that came past, out. Yeah. yeah. Past, um, Con, whether it was a conflict, an inner conflict, a conflict mm -hmm. with a person, you know, I found myself wanting to like right wrongs, even if they were really minor, you know, mm -hmm. people out there mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. So, how how long after you quit drinking did that come up for you? Yeah, that took a while. Mm -hmm. That was like at least six months, mm -hmm. and then uh, maybe from the six month point to the year point, I spent a lot of time kind of thinking about that and doing those sorts of revisiting chapters of my life. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that it's completely over and I'm past the two year point. So mm -hmm. I feel like I'm still in a way integrating and that's the term mm -hmm. I like to use is integrating parts of my past mm -hmm. into my consciousness yeah. rather than trying to just not think about them. Right, right. Which is, I mean, unfortunately, and I understand it because we live in a really intense world, right? But a lot of us are grabbing onto alcohol or weed or something else like that to essentially not sort of face what's going on, right? Because it's it's also overwhelming. And, you know, I, I totally get that myself and have been down that path many times. And particularly, I see this in myself and I see this in with women I work with in their 40s, like the body really does keep the score and things start showing up on a different level. Right. And it's kind of demanding in a way <laughs> that you start to face these things, right? Because essentially trauma does underlie hormonal imbalances, even though it's natural for, you know, hormones to change the trauma that is, has been built up over a lifetime is really just kind of rising to the surface in a different way during this time. Yeah. And it's sort of a shame that there hasn't been collective wisdom enough to teach young women yes. to be present in a way mm -hmm. with, I mean, the forties are sort of known for that, right? Trauma, mm -hmm. just like bubbling up from mm -hmm. your youth. And mm -hmm. it would be nice if, if we could have a, 
cultural experience where we support women in a way that helps them process things sooner. Absolutely. Um, yeah. With or without, you know, putting down drinking or not, you know, mm-hmm. it's just hard to say uh, the way that the psyche operates, you know, mm-hmm. if, if these kinds of things would bubble up for processing sooner. Do we even have the wisdom for these things to come right. up in our twenties? Right. Good point. Yeah. But I definitely like the idea of giving tools to our youth, you know, to the girls, especially actually, um, I'm doing a, an interview with the hormone summit with a woman that's focusing on tweens, you know, teaching tweens about their cycle and just the process and the normality of going through all these changes and all the emotional stuff that comes up and how to work with it instead of, you know, denying it and also teaching the moms and the dads how to work with it too. Right. Because part of it is you got to get the whole family on board for it to be sort of okay for these girls to go through that process in a different yes, way. Yeah. A common language. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, oof, yes, there's so many things that <laughs> would be amazing, right. If we were able to change the whole spectrum. And I do think people are working on that right now, which is great, you know, so, um, a long way for sure. Yes. Since, you know, since we were kids. Exactly. It's so, so, so different for sure. Um, so, was there anything that you sort of put in place of alcohol to kind of, kind of pull back from it? Or was it just like, okay, I'm cold Turkey on this and I'm just like fully, fully in and facing everything. Um, I leaned into some CBD use Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that scene because I was still having, (laughs) I had been using alcohol so regularly that I would find myself kind of my nervous system escalating, escalating, escalating. And I'm like, it's dinner time. Where's my glass of wine? Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm like, Oh crap. You know, I don't have the glass of wine. So at that point, um, that was early on when I was Mm -hmm. still having some degree of a physical dependency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I used CBD oil. So Mm -hmm. like a a full spectrum, I don't personally like to get buzzed with, Mm -hmm. uh, THC, CBD, CBD can give you a buzz if Mm -hmm. you're used too much. So Mm -hmm. Um, that took some fine tuning, you know, mm-hmm. to actually have it be um, de-escalating mm-hmm. and yet not give me a buzz. Right, right. Um, so yeah. there are certain kinds, like if you go to a shop, you can tell them like specifically, you know, that you just want like a nervous system relaxant mm-hmm. and don't want to feel any psychotropic effects mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. help guide you. There are some new strains out. There's um, CBCO, I want to say. Um, I'm no expert, but I'm starting to research into the C- land of CBD a little bit more because they are discovering um, certain, they're isolating uh, certain aspects that are just nervous system regulators. Mm-hmm. So they're healthier mm-hmm. for kids. Oh, nice. So yeah. That's an option for our daughter, you know, yeah. instead right. of like a heavy pharmaceutical load, right. we don't have her on, you know, we could be benefiting <clears throat> from the, uh, support of CBD as long as it's not psychotropic. Yeah. And I, I'm so glad you brought up the nervous system because that really is what we're talking about when, you know, usually when we reach for a glass of wine or a cocktail is like, we're really trying to bring down that kind of high cortisol that's going on, right. From our super stressful days and the regulation of the nervous system, you know, underlies any sex hormone imbalance. So, you know, women are like, what can I do about my estrogen? What can I do about my progesterone? I'm like, let's talk your cortisol first because none of that, you can't fix the estrogen and progesterone if you don't fix the cortisol. And really that's the nervous system, you know? Right. So what are healthy relaxation techniques? Mm -hmm. How Mm -hmm. could we have this collection of options Mm -hmm. as more standardized part of our kind of go to like, Hey, let's take a bath. Let's force myself to go on a walk around the neighborhood, mm-hmm. do 20 push ups. you know, I mean, yep. just yep. so many different little tricks, even if you don't have a lot of time to help break that cortisol mm-hmm. rush in your mm-hmm. system. Mm-hmm. So CBD helped. Um, when I came to social engagements, that was tricky Yeah, because all I think my that's the trickiest. Tricks. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that yeah. not all. Okay. So there is a, <laughs> there is kind of a younger crew in the dance community that I hang with that mm-hmm. are not so into alcohol, mm-hmm. um, but they're sort of the minority of my kind of 
daily who I interact with. Mm -hmm. Most of the people I interact with regularly, they're all my age and mm -hmm. they all drink. Mm -hmm. um, so one workaround, I was leaning into the seltzers for a while, mm -hmm. but they gave me a twitch, believe it or not. Oh yeah. Too much phosphorus in seltzer that water. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. Man, I will get a muscle twitch like nobody's business. Mm -hmm. It'll be in my leg. It'll be in my eye. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, this is not helping. <laughs> <You're> like, <"Yeah." laughs> so I kind of had to, you know, I can do like half a kombucha and half a seltzer a mm -hmm. day. And because mm -hmm. I found that I was going out with friends, like to a bar setting, yeah. and I was having um, a ginger beer that they mm -hmm. had. And I alcoholic ginger beer and man mm -hmm. I was getting a hangover just from the sugar the sugar yeah I know people don't uh, I, I mean I love that they have some of these options but being a person that pay, pays a lot of attention to sugar and I you know tell my clients to too because obviously that has a huge impact on cortisol and all the you know body systems like yeah you can't you can't go crazy on the ginger beers and these other things that they have there you know so I'm really intrigued like I went to a, an event last year where they had um you know this non-alcoholic gin and mm -hmm. the person there was a bartender and she just created this amazing you know uh mocktail essentially with this non-alcoholic gin and i loved it because it tasted i'm actually not really a gin fan anyway but it tasted like a really clean gin yeah. but, and you didn't get a it's interesting because like you didn't get a buzz off of it but yet you kind of did <laughs> you know like yeah, it's sort of by association right totally so I've had those uh mock liquors mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine who owns the Asheville dispensary mm -hmm. uh, is looking into potentially selling those there I think or if nice. not just serving the drinks they have a whole menu right to non-alcoholic beverages it's one right. of the only places in town that it I does that yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody just told me recently that they're opening up a non-alcoholic bar in Asheville. Oh, exciting. Hope, I know, very exciting because I think that's another thing. Like, I think it's so hard. Like, yeah, if you stay home, it can be sort of easier to, to pull it out. And of course, you're going to hit some bumps in the road. But then at least for me, it's always been harder when I go out socially again, right? Because you're just like, oh, it's all around me, especially like I want to say, especially in Asheville, but, you know, people could be listening to this on the other side of the world. And honestly, alcohol is a big part of most cultures, you know, so it's, it's not, it's really something that a lot of women have to face. Um, and so, you know, obviously having options, more and more options for people so that we still, cause you want to still be social. It's not like you want to cut off your social life. My favorite thing to order when mm -hmm. I'm out with friends is a tall pour of soda water mm -hmm. in a wine glass, mm -hmm. no ice mm -hmm. with bitters. Mm, love bitters. Add bitters to the point. It looks like a rosé. Mm, nice. So it's served and it's chilled. The whole glass has all those little water droplets, you know, mm -hmm. by the time it gets to you and it's just like gleaming, just mm -hmm. like a rosé on a rooftop bar. Situation. Nice. I like that. And, you know, bitters are so great for your digestion too. So, you know, if you, if you're a person that likes a cocktail with bitters, that's a really good replacement right there what you just yeah recommended it's like a rosé in fact people yeah. have, are like geez tall poor what i got you know, really <laughs> my, my glass is not even half that full right and i just paid like 12 dollars more than you right. did <laughs> yeah. mocktails can add up you know the ones that are it's actually true. on menus yep absolutely. that's my sort of affordability you know yeah, yeah sneaky affordability yeah, yeah. What about like when I know for me, you know, I think some of the hardest is thinking about like in the summer and going to like the beach or the lake or camping, you know, when, when you're sort of concentrated long periods of time with other people drinking around you. So how has it been for you in those situations? Kombucha and CBD. <laughs> you're like, just keep it coming. <laughs> <laughs> I, pretty much. No, yeah. actually, I don't. I don't really even, I bring the CBD mm -hmm. as a crush. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. I actually stopped using the CBD after that, like first year, I probably used it on and off. And mm. then, then I gave it all to my dog who was dying, all of it that I had left. Mm. And then I just forgot about it. And that was last November. Okay. So I haven't actually used the CBD since November. And I have done a beach trip with yeah. friends who were yeah. all drinking. Yeah. And I think I brought CBD, but I never really cracked into it. Um, having a, a nice chilled kombucha, like 
I think part of it is when I see my friends have all these special drinks mm-hmm. and I don't have a special drink. Mm-hmm. I don't have a special drink. So yeah. like, I just have to prepare yeah. and, you know, bring a little cooler. And I think, um, serving it in a glass, like at, whether it's a plastic wine glass or some kind of pretty vessel mm-hmm. to make it feel a little bit more special occasion really mm-hmm. goes a long way for mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, I think kombucha is always a good option, you know, unless people are like, on a hardcore antifungal diet, but it's a good option because it's going to be a lot less sugar than like a mocktail is going to be, you know, kefir and it's even better from sorry. the kefir soda. Oh, kefir soda. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. As far yes. as sugar, low sugar. Yep. Absolutely. And there's so many flavors out there now. Right. So yeah. it's like, you can, if you do go to the beach, you can get your little like six pack, like one of each kind of flavor of kombucha. So you're keeping it. Yeah. Uh, interesting as everybody's doing their thing. Yeah. yeah. To see more kefir sodas. Yes. Because yeah. the kombuchas, I bring them in that yeah. context, but I'm getting sugar dumped like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. The, if there were more variety, if kefir sodas were even available. Yeah. You know, anywhere Which they're not everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know about the, ju- the June. I never have actually drank any of those. Have you tried those? I have. And it's, um, those are kind of sugary too. It's made with honey. Yeah. And I believe it's green tea. Mm-hmm. Is it green tea and honey instead of black tea and sugar? Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. And so it's a little healthier. Yeah. Um, gotcha. But kefir soda is where it's at. So really what I would like to be doing is making my own kefir soda mm-hmm. at home and mm-hmm. then bringing a few mason jars with me in a cooler, mm-hmm. you know, on a trip where I have these incredible self-care concoctions that aren't yeah. going to give me a twitch. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I'm trying to keep the twitch out of the situation. How is it when, you know, so you've got your, your drinks and you're feeling good about that. But then obviously if people are drinking alcohol all day, like their personality is going to shift right as the day goes on. And how, how does that feel for you now to be around that? Like, is it, that feels annoying. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's why it's like, I don't like to go to a bar (laughs) and stay late (laughs) because as people get drunk, you're like, okay, this is no fun for me. (laughs) Well, and I'm a little bit sensitive to when the children are around. Oh, uh uh-huh. Yeah, for sure. So now I feel, you know, when, when perhaps like, again, I wasn't a heavy drinker. So my, Mm -hmm. my, um, language would never slur my speech, Mm -hmm. but you know, other people are more quick to slurring, you know, even without a lot of alcohol. Yeah. And so I just feel really sensitive for mm-hmm. what the kids are experiencing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I try to kind of bait and switch like, oh, hey, kids, come over here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll do this instead. Like, it's much more fun over here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that that is hard. Even if no children are there, I mean, I'm not going to like, promote this on Facebook or whatever, but in fact, this has been really hard for me to not publish, but I can smell people's breath from like, since I stopped drinking, mm. I can smell their alcohol breath. Mm-hmm. It's like, so it has increased my sense of smell mm-hmm. and just awareness mm-hmm. in general. Mm-hmm. So especially men, cause they're just like, they kind of talk heavy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And and, and if they're like, drinking, <laughs> I'm like, back it up. Yeah. 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 I can imagine. Yeah. Because so alcohol that, is an intense smell. It is an intense yeah. smell. So yeah. especially liquor, you know, I can yeah. smell whiskey, you know, especially those, those heavier liquors. Mm-hmm. Um, I can smell them like five feet away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the health stuff that you've, you know, kind of noticed since you've cut it out. Cause I'm sure sort of the health shifts that happen at six months and there's even, you know, more and different ones that happen in a year and then on and on, right. Just because the healing process obviously brings up different stuff over time. So, um, had, I guess, did you feel the need to like go into therapy or anything after, uh, diving into this? Cause of the stuff that was coming up for you. Uh, let's see, I guess, uh, technically I have been in both couples therapy and personal therapy Mm -hmm. since before we stopped Mm -hmm. and my husband also stopped Mm -hmm. drinking. Oh, okay. Right. And I do want to talk about that too. Family, you know, that family dynamic for sure. 
Yeah. So we have both, we had been in therapy and then, um, I continue to be Mm -hmm. in therapy so that I have a healthy place to kind of drop stuff off. Yeah. You know, all this stuff I'm processing that is like at my feet from my whole life that just kind of went unprocessed. I'm not burdening my girlfriends with. Right. Right. So did you notice a change in your therapy since you were doing it beforehand? Did you notice that you started maybe getting more out of therapy or just how you related was different in therapy afterwards? I think I started noticing that there were a lot more underlying things bothering my nervous system Mm -hmm. than I was giving credit to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, there are maybe, let's say we walk around on a daily basis and we think, oh, this is a real thorn in my side or it's my job or it's Mm -hmm. my child acting up when I feel the executive function of our brain is heightened exponentially mm-hmm. and that allows us it's like pineal gland stuff mm-hmm. Pineal, mm-hmm. how do you say that word yeah you got it mm-hmm. um I feel that I without the alcohol in my system for an extended period of time mm-hmm. now I'm able to see the ways that um, unresolved traumas whether they be big or small mm-hmm how they play a subtle impact, how they subtly impact my nervous system Mm -hmm. and and my state, you know, of overall perceived, you know, joy and Mm -hmm. ease. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I feel like in a way I'm getting more out of therapy because I'm just addressing that there's a lot more to process Mm -hmm. than I, maybe I used to just go and talk about my husband and my child or something. Right. 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 I talk about a lot more from my past Mm-hmm. and um yeah I'm sure yeah there are benefits I and I think you know therapy I see this a lot um and I almost always guide my clients to do therapy while we're working together because any kind of healing process again trauma underlies it you know that's just like part of the deal and most, I don't want to say most women, but a lot of us women are just going through life because we are so busy and just kind of like keeping that stuff, just like barely, you know, under the surface and just like managing in that way. Yeah. Um, It's survival. It's survival. Absolutely. Yeah. And so to get to a point where you're really starting to unpack that old stuff, right? Because like almost every trigger that we have now comes from something from childhood, you know, the type of therapy I get, I do goes into even like conception and preconception of our lifetimes, you know? So we have all these kind of like, maybe even what you would think of as like small or mini traumas, but they're really impacting how we move through the world. Right. Until we have a chance to unpack and get into that stuff, they're ruling everything, you know? And so and yeah. alcohol is another one of those mm-hmm. mini agitators, if mm-hmm. you will. Mm-hmm. So causing these micro wounds just mm. from like a fatigue standpoint, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. from, and you had talked a little bit about the general health impact mm-hmm. benefit wise. And I do feel that my cycle mm-hmm. especially has been, so I have suffered from menstrual cramps forever. I mean, from the moment I got my period, Mm -hmm. I, you know, Mm -hmm. at 13 years old, I've had cramping and really terrible cramping. And I mean, some of the worst illnesses related to my cycle were when I had drank the night before. Mm -hmm. Oh Mm -hmm. boy. Look, I, I would crave it. Interestingly, right. The day before I were to start my cycle that night before I would want to tie one on, man. Yep. Yep. I don't know why it works like that because that is the absolute worst time. It is. It is basically your hormones drop to nothing in that, you know, essentially two days before, but really you're at your base zero that day before. And so your system is trying to kind of like build back up, you know? And so it will crave the, it'll crave carbohydrates. It'll crave alcohol, which is essentially, you know, uh, it's sugar, right? Right. So, and it's that fast impact of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, that's totally common. And, you know, there's a study that shows one alcoholic drink can raise your estrogen immediately. Right. And so we're working, uh, especially in perimenopause where estrogen is going way too high 
while our progesterone is dropping because we're not ovulating as consistently. And so with estrogen dominance, we have, you know, everything from um, our boobs hurting to, you know, more painful periods to more bleeding to fibroids, so ovarian cysts and all these kinds of things, you know? So if you think about drinking even one drink five nights a week, that's raising your estrogen right there, right? And your liver has to detoxify all of that. And it has to detoxify the estrogen that's being raised too, you know? So that's the point that I think is, I try and put a fine point with clients. Sometimes I, I know it's hard to cut out alcohol or cut back on alcohol, but if you're trying to do any kind of hormone balancing, it's pretty impossible to do without cutting out alcohol, especially in your forties. Yeah. Yeah. And I felt like my body just wasn't processing alcohol as exactly. well. I mean, not mm -hmm. that it ever processed it super yep. well. I've always had, I've always been some degree of a lightweight. Mm hmm. Mm hmm but I was becoming increasingly so yep. as I aged. Um, out of my periods, you know, I've, at this point I've had like 25 monthly cycles. I'm still regular, even mm -hmm. though I'm approaching perimenopause. Mm -hmm. And I would say historically, all 25 of those would have had bad cramps. Yeah. And now that I don't drink alcohol, maybe one of them has given me substantial cramping. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing, right? Yeah. When you look at your whole life having cramps. Yeah. Yeah. And so it is essentially ruled out cramping. And the one time that I did get cramping, I knew right away that it was from dehydration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like, I have this awareness over my hydration levels mm -hmm. because I don't drink alcohol that I never had before. Yes. Oh, and everybody's walking around dehydrated. Really? You know, I mean, you know, the, the alcohol, the coffee, but even without those, most of us are not, we don't get enough potassium and sodium on a daily basis. So absolutely. I've, I've noticed that in myself too, you know, that when you're really start to pay attention to your body, you notice that hydration level, you know, and that's key. Those minerals underlie the whole damn system, <laughs> you know, if you don't get those right. So in terms of how about like a, from the spiritual perspective, do you feel like your spirituality has changed since you removed alcohol too? Yes. Yeah. So I also had a pretty severe illness last year. So it's hard for me to differentiate between if I'm getting the spiritual wisdom from essentially a near death experience mm. or if I'm getting, I know I was getting it before that. Um, because I was making like blog posts and stuff about it. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, I am much clearer about where I want to spend my time mm -hmm. and where I want to invest my pursuits in general. Mm -hmm. You know, where am I headed? What am I doing? I've got 30 years left of my working life, for mm -hmm. example. And mm -hmm. where am I going to invest that, that time? Mm -hmm. And so I'm planning and scheming. And um, I would say that I just don't procrastinate like I mm -hmm. used to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will like pack an overnight bag for myself ahead of time. Mm -hmm. I will, um, you know, change some sort of maintenance thing before it's ever required. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just like a bit more one step ahead. Mm -hmm. And it feels it's, so good, right? You're like, yes. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. I've never quite been like, super girl scout prepared. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now that I don't have the distraction of like catching up from not feeling well, because mm. I would have even a slight hangover off of two glasses of wine. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Yep. I say you hit 40, your hangover's coming. <laughs> like yeah. it just is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it feels really good to have that sovereignty where, okay, right. Like I can get a lot of stuff done in the world and I can contribute my service to mm -hmm. the greater good. And I don't need that crutch in mm -hmm. order to tap into what I have to offer the world. Mm -hmm. And I love that because I see this time of our lives, you know, our forties, perimenopause, what have you is the time where we really do sort of our soul kind of declares itself. Right. And like what, what we're doing in the second half of our lives, which is, I think much more for women themselves versus the first half tends to be more about for the family and for others, right. And what the world maybe wanted from us. Yeah. So to have that clarity for that message to come through, I think is hugely important in healing, super healing in and of itself. 
Yeah. And I think it comes through a lot clearer, the mm -hmm. sound of the message, if you're not routinely fatigued, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you're not in an altered state, a good part of the time, mm -hmm. you know, there's, Absolutely. there's this compounding effect of even minimal altered states mm -hmm. if you're routine enough. Yeah. Absolutely. Or you're checking out. I mean, there's, there's really no other way, you mm -hmm. know, to, to frame it. You're numbing out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was numbing out totally, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and it just feels really good to, um, be on a track. What feels more like a fast track. Yeah. To the things that I want to accomplish in life. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely want to talk about your family here in a minute, but do you have moments where you're like, okay, I want to drink at this point, like after two years, I am still human and I, yeah. and I'm still, you know, I'm very social. So yeah. I really like to hang out with people. And that's definitely a social lubricant, even mm -hmm. as social and extroverted as I am, it's something I grew accustomed to. Mm -hmm. Um, so putting myself, but you know, it's interesting because I can get contact high. Mm -hmm. Pretty yeah. easily actually, yeah. you know, yeah. if I'm in yeah, a group yeah. of people who I really like and people are feeling no pain and not sloppy necessarily, mm -hmm. just, you know, feeling really open yeah. um, because I am naturally very open. It actually just like uh, connects to all of my senses, you know, I'm mm. like, oh, great. I get to be my whole self yeah. here because everybody else is being, is tapping into more of themselves that they may not have access to without a crush. Without yeah. 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 I, I love that because it's, so true that we're energetic beings and we play off of energy and you're talking about getting to that point where it's like, you're playing off your, the sort of natural energy, right? Even though other people it's coming from something that's helping them get there, you're able to kind of play off that natural energy from yourself and then what's coming through them and still having as good of a time. Cause I think that's important for people to, to hear, you know, that that is possible. I think my actual time frame that mm. I feel that is much shorter than it would be if I were using alcohol. Mm. You mean so you get like, there faster kind of thing? Or no, I mean no. Like I'm there for say two hours uh -huh. instead of four or five hours. Right. Like I used to be with the help, with the right. assistance. Right. Right. So it's like after two hours, I'm like, okay, you know, yeah. I've kind of like, you're full sort of blown my serotonin load in yeah. a way yeah, and yeah. not like artificially ramping Keeping it going. Back up. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That I think is my bigger challenge is when I go out to events where I know that people are going to be partaking in mm -hmm. substances. Like I just need to go home when I'm tired, mm -hmm. you know, right. And right. I get tired, you know, more right. than faster than they do. Sure. Cause it's your body's natural rhythms without yeah. throwing something in. Yeah. I mean, and, and I, I mean, I, you know, I think we all go through moments where it's like, I want to be 20 again and just like go all night and that not be a big deal. But the reality is it is, you know, like it is and sleep is huge. <laughs> for a while I tried like, okay, I'm going to do this heavy caffeine thing when I mm -hmm. go to this party mm -hmm. or, um, I know that I tried like some tobacco thing that you mm. eat. It's like this little kind of grain of rice and you just like put it in your lip, like dip. And I mean, I don't smoke. I don't yeah. like tobacco. Like, yeah. no, that was, that was pointless. Yeah. Anyway, so, you know, like I've been experimenting, trying to come up with some kind of euphoria arsenal in the tincture department yep. or something. And totally. I've, you know, a, a nice cup of like Earl Grey with honey and milk, you mm -hmm. know, is better, I think, to give me. So that's something I really lean into is nourishing hot teas. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised mm -hmm. how much more satisfying that is, mm -hmm. even when everyone's drinking. I mean, not during the day, but sure. like at night. Yeah. Um, that that uh, proves to soothe me personally mm. more than say, you know, some fancy mocktail. Right. Right. That makes sense to me, especially. Yeah. Certain times of the year. So good for the body. Yeah. So going back to, you said your husband stopped at the same time as you did. So was that something that you asked him to do or he was like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to, this is good for me too. Or tell us about I, that process. Um, 
I believe the first comment I made was, you know, our marriage is going to take a nosedive if you don't quit. Too. <laughs> You're like gauntlet thrown. <laughs> yeah. And then I talked to a friend who is a addiction counselor and she's like, girl, you cannot even say that. Like, you, can't, you have no right to say that to him. Mm-hmm. And you, um, that avoiding a substance is somebody's personal choice. And if Mm -hmm. they cannot come to it from their own sovereignty, then it's not worth coming to Mm -hmm. for them. And Mm -hmm. it's not even worth like, no, she just uh, put the kibosh on. (laughs) You're like, I already said it though. (laughs) She's right. And so I had to go back and say, never mind. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) Just just kidding. Yeah. You just, you do you. I'll Mm -hmm. be over here doing me sober Mm -hmm. style. (laughs) And uh, it took him maybe three weeks before, you know, I let him off the hook to just have his free will. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that nose dive comment probably stuck with him. <laughs> He's like, okay, well, I can, but can I really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would have been hard, to be honest. Yeah. Like, it would have been really hard for me if he was drinking yeah. because he drank more than I did. Yeah. And so that would have been ever more noticeable yeah 100 you know, percent in the house yeah we were not mm-hmm. also buzzed you know mm-hmm. to see him get buzzed more than I would have gotten buzzed and right. with some sort of routine yeah so I'm very grateful that yeah, he absolutely stopped and he hit his two-year mark as well like two weeks ago and um wow and he knows it was a good move for him yeah. he he resisted it a lot I think he had a harder time with it, it quitting mm-hmm. um perhaps than well, I did it, it's tough I have a client who is um I mean they're younger you know they're in their 30s but she's um you know looking towards fertility and they were working on some hormone stuff and I said you know during this segment of time while we're working on this protocol you know, at least you should quit drinking, you know? And, uh, so she was like, so can I have any alcohol at all? And I was like, it's up to you, you know, but this is just sort of the reality. And she said, you know, she's so hard with my husband because he has no real need to quit, you know? And I said, well, I get it. And their thirties, it's tough, but in reality, 50% of fertility actually comes from the men. Yeah. And so it can be impacted them without them realizing it. You know, yeah. we all, we put all of that on the women that it's their right. issue, but really a lot of it comes from the health of the sperm. And then I was like, they hit their forties and their testosterone starts going partially because of the alcohol too, you know? So it really is beneficial for them on a lot of levels that they may, may not realize too, you know, but it just, it's a little more obvious, I think in women's bodies. Like we quit and we're like, okay, we feel better, you know? And they're like, uh, yeah, I, I miss my beer. That. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. So when I ask him what his, you know, what are his benefits? He, he routinely says, I don't miss the hangover. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I think that's as, you know, in regard to other health benefits that are more nuanced, I don't mm-hmm. think he noticed that notices them quite as much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause you know, I could go on for days about yeah. all the myriad of <laughs> benefits, Things, yeah. but you know, he just doesn't see it that way. He, right. I think he's a little bit bent out of shape about it still. maybe. <laughs> so in terms of your daughter, do you feel like she really noticed a difference once you quit? Um, well, I, it's hard to say, mm-hmm. but I did notice that she would say things like, those people are drinking alcohol, mom. <laughs> I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> She's oh, like, no. I got my eye on everybody now. Yeah. Oh, like the cigarette smoking or the alcohol mm-hmm. drinking or like, because I explained to her that it's not good for our bodies, that mm-hmm. it actually acts more like a poison inside our bodies than it does like some kind of health elixir, you know? I mean, it's mm-hmm. certainly not that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But she, you know, being a child that she is kind of, uh, black and white. Black and that. white. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when she sees some of my friends drinking, she's just like, mm-hmm. that kind of reaction. So um, it'll be interesting later in life if she recognizes, you know, I, I think obviously kids are tuned in on a deeper level than they can maybe necessarily even, you know, consciously speak to at the time. 
but she then later in life hey yeah. she was only six mm-hmm. you know so when, she yeah. was six when I quit mm-hmm. um but I can tell you my parent I'm much more patient mm-hmm. I do not blow a gasket nearly mm-hmm. as often and as intensely mm-hmm. as I would as you did you know, before yeah she, yeah she presents some unique challenges and yeah. so the nature of the challenges she presents sometimes, man, they like blow my mind, you know, Mm -hmm. and I just, in the past, I did not have very good, um, self-calming techniques Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I would just get completely flustered and blown over and end up resorting to anger instead of processing with her in Mm -hmm. in a healthy way, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think a lot of parents do that in our culture in general, like, the whole punishment, like that's just off limits, you know, just don't ever say that again. Mm -hmm. um, And the way that she operates or any child for that matter, you know, really unpacking what it means that she just said and Mm -hmm. how others feel when those words are said and how she might be, you know, I mean, it is just like being kind of a therapist, you know, all the time. And can you imagine having a drunk therapist? Right. Right. And these are the things that, you know, we're working with generational trauma, right? All of us, right? Because (laughs) lots of bad things have been happening for long periods of time, right? And it keeps getting passed down. And so really you taking this step to, you know, work on yourself to get real clarity, to be able to be in who you are, you're not only healing yourself, but you're healing your daughter, right? Before she gets- Yeah. And and really breaking some of that generational trauma. And I mean, I think that's what the world needs more than just about anything else right now. Right. (laughs) So much of what we see in the world is based on this internal trauma that we're not dealing with, you know, so that's my little soapbox about that. (laughs) I'm absolutely doing my part to heal that ancestral wounding that is very alive in my DNA thread, Mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's a beautiful thing. Right. And so that's, that's where I think these um, just these habits that we have in life, right. That we don't really necessarily see as a big deal are actually like the deepest part of our healing process and, and healing the family stuff, you know, and, and really, yeah. Bringing up our kids into hopefully a world that's much kinder to each other because they don't have to carry all that trauma on their backs with them. So, yeah. So kudos to you for that too, because I think that's huge, you know? Um, yeah. So, um, anything else before we wrap up that we didn't cover? Hmm. This is where I should have taken notes. (laughs) I wanted to say, um, do you feel like it's something long-term for you or are you just sort of saying, not saying uh, it's long-term? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I consider that, you know, I mean, I, honestly, I've been considering that question the whole time, mm-hmm. you know, is this something long term, or is this something I could kind of dabble back into. Mm-hmm. But honestly, the benefits so far outweigh mm-hmm. the, you know, social cost, mm-hmm. if you know, like the social mm-hmm. convenience cost. Right. right. Um, and then I have my workarounds. I have my foes. <laughs> I like it. Oh, rosé. And then I'll have my kefir sodas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I get to brewing those at home, then I'll really be set. Right. And then you can start selling them at events too. Be yeah, part of the whole I entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurial. Right. Exactly what I need. <laughs> You're like, add it on. <laughs> okay. You know, so I've gotten a lot better about that. Like, because yeah. I am an ideas person. Right. Right. So yeah. I am able to focus now and in, instead of have all of my many, many, mm-hmm. many mm-hmm. entrepreneurial concepts sort of divide my time. Yeah. Be more grounded, essentially. Yeah. 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 Okay. So people can find you at your website, right? They can. Yes. And that's tifahalic.com. Um, and I'm happy to take qu- like Q and a there yeah. as well. If I said anything that a listener would want to find more about has questions about, you know, you don't need to be contacting me necessarily for sustainability reasons or, yeah. um, the services I offer through my site, but, you know, on this topic, I'm happy to field questions. Well, thanks for offering that because I bet some people do have some questions, especially if they've been pondering 
you know, the process. So, um, so feel free to reach out for her, every, everyone. Um, thanks for being here today. I appreciate you talking to everybody about this process because I think it's so wonderful for women to hear. And I will see you guys next time. Thanks for having me.